just let us know, please. Um, gotcha now. Yes, people say. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I want to reintroduce Mike Tempesta from EVH Charvel and Jackson. He handles uh, their their artist relations. Uh, he's also had a, a really amazing career in the music industry, uh, working with uh, Scott Ian of Anthrax, I believe Jerry Cantrell, uh, a whole bunch of people. So I want to dive real deep into all of that with him tonight. Again, sorry for uh, for the uh, the audio problems, but I think we're we're doing better now. So, uh, Mike, how are you? All good. How are you guys? I'm good. I'm good, man. It's uh, it's finally the weekend, so I feel good. Exactly. Don't yeah. forget Mother's Day. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, we're going to the beach and uh, doing stuff with the family. So, what about what about you guys? You know what? You figured you could you would be able to do that in California, but right now it's kind of like overcast and cloudy and rainy. Really? Yeah, I kind of like it. <laughs> That's unusual for uh, it reminds you of home. Exactly. I was going to say you're from you're from New York, right? We're from the same place. I am. You're from, from the Bronx. You're from the Bronx. Yeah, I'm from Brooklyn, so we're from the boroughs. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And yeah. Dave's from Detroit. Yeah, tough yeah. guy. Close we're enough. Rock City. <laughs> that's exactly. It's uh, all good. Um, so you grew up in in New York, Mike? I did. Yep. Spent, uh, let's see, I moved out to California and I think the first time was around, oh, Jesus, probably 84, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've been out here back and forth since then the entire time. I haven't really gone back. I mean, I, I love New York. I miss it. Right. Especially the food. But uh, yeah, the food that's that's the best part, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> that, that is the best part. Dave, I'll send you the link in just a second, by the way. Just give me one second as I get sorted. Um, but yeah, I, I actually may have some work coming up in New York soon. And I'm the one thing that I definitely want to do is I want to check out the uh, the Metropolitan Museum with all the uh, the guitars and everything, I guess. Play it loud, it's called or. I definitely need to check that out myself. Yeah. A lot of exhibits there. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of just, you know, I mean, even like uh, the Jimmy Page stuff, the, the EV, you know, Van Halen. Van Halen stuff. Yeah. I was just about to say the Eddie stuff is crazy. Um, yeah. But I was, I, I was checking out the Jimmy Page stuff too. I've been playing my Les Paul a lot lately. So I've been kind of on the Jimmy Page kick, you know? Um, so, uh, so you moved out, you said, in the 80s to, to L.A.? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's cool. And I uh, was living with my brother, John. And I was like, oh, man, okay, what am I going to do? Where am I going to – I didn't have any work. I was just kind of hanging out. And I got a phone call from Scott Ian because we grew up with Charlie and Frankie. Mm. Um, Frankie, went to the, Frankie Bello went to the same high school. Is my brother and I. Oh, Lehman cool. High School in the Bronx. Yeah. That's awesome. So, you know, we kind of knew those guys and, you know, grew up with them. My brother was real close with Charlie. And, yeah, my brother moved out to L.A. first. He uh, joined Exodus at the time. And he was looking for a roommate. And I was working at an industrial tool warehouse in the Bronx. I'm like, okay. Yeah, I, California sounds about right now you know so i moved out and was looking for work and charlie called my brother and said uh scott was looking for a guitar tech and if i'd be interested in doing it mm -hmm. i was like sure why not i never guitar tech a day in my life you know i knew enough about gear i was like i, I could figure it out so uh yeah that was the first time i ever guitar tech and it was for the uh, persistence of time tour and that was in um, 1990, I believe, when that record was released. And uh, Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the first stop on the tour was Australia. 
New Zealand, and Japan. So good way to start. That's things. a great way to start. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So did you have to yeah. like brush up your skills where you're, where you're like, okay, I, you know, I play guitar. I, I know, I, you know, I know some stuff, but where you're like, this is, this is big time now. I'm going on the road. Oh yeah. You know, I, there was nothing, there was no internet, you know, there was nothing like that. So I'd buy all these like guitar books, had repair books. Yeah. And, Dan Irwin book. Yeah. It's whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Try and figure things out and started taking things apart myself and, pulling pickups out in pots and replacing hardware. I'm like, I think I can do this. <laughs> and he had, he had a fairly simple rig, too. I mean. Is that the VHD power amps, or who had that? Didn't that was some... Jerry Cantrell. No, didn't Anthrax have some? Oh, no. that was Dan Spitz. Right. I remember, I think we sold them to him. You did? Or sold to the tech or someone. He was using Wagner fish preamps and the yeah. VHT power amps. Right, right, yeah. When I was at making music, right at the time around that that era. Hmm. Oh, so my timeline is wrong because I'm thinking back. So I did get to LA probably around 1990 was the first time, hmm. and that's when I started working for Anthrax. And then, yeah, then I moved back to New York for a little while and moved back in '94 to LA. So. Okay, that's the timeline. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got but it. Scott, going back to gear, Scott was using um, JCM 800s. Yeah. 100 watt JCM 800s and the infamous TC Electronics booster distortion panel. Just like on boost, boost, right? Then on boost. Just like you used to use. Well, yeah. What, what do you think I got it from? <laughs> I mean, the guy had crushing tone. Yeah. So, so, and he had the 6550s in his main 800. Big, bold power tube. Yeah. Uh, and 80 watt selection speakers. Hmm. So, super tight bottom end. And uh, his main guitar was Jackson Soloist, Yankee model, all maple. Body, neck, ebony wow, fingerboard. Wow, must have been heavy. It was heavy. And uh, Duncan JB in the bridge. Mm -hmm. Ah. So that was the tone, folks, right there. And that would be the original Jackson. Yeah. 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 Prefender, and, right. The Grover Jackson Jackson. Yeah, so it was a really simple setup. He had like three heads in a rack. You know, ran two of them and two or four cabs, depending on the venue, the TC Electronics boost. And that was it back then. And you said it was a, a, a soloist. Uh, what did you say? Dixie model? A Jackson soloist. Yeah. But and then you said it was something else after that. Oh, no, oh no, maple body, maple neck, ebony fingerboard. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, oh, Yankee soloist. Yankee. Because it had the New York. Yankees uh, logo. Oh, on the okay. Box. I was, for some reason, yeah, I, I was that. I was thinking Dixie. Okay, you said Yankee. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. And from from the twelfth fret up, that guitar was fretless. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. And he had a big knot inlay in the fingerboard, and for he used that, to he use that. Use the oh, uh, past the twelfth fret. I was about to he ask did, uh, for bring the noise. The, the Public Enemy song. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, like they did that, that collaboration with Public Enemy. And he'd do the slide up from the 12th fret up there. That Public uh -huh. Enemy sound. Right, 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 right. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nice, nice. So uh, so take the, keep keep us going. So that's when you first... Is that like when you first got into the music industry, when working for, for Scott and for Anthrax? Yeah, I mean, because before that, I mean, you know, I was just in in the Bronx growing up and playing guitar and idolizing, you know, Randy Rhodes and Van Halen and Michael Schenker and guys like that, wanting to be them and playing in, well, I never even actually played in any club bands. I, I'd jam around with some friends and it never kind of got anywhere. 
my brother John, he was playing in a a, a band called Jackals, and uh, used to help actually help them load gear in and out of the clubs. And uh, I remember getting stuck outside of clubs like the Rising Sun because I wasn't in Yonkers, New York, because I wasn't old enough to uh, be in there because they serve alcohol. So I'd be sitting outside with a couple of my buddies just freezing in the winter, you know, until their set was over, <laughs> trying to sneak in somehow. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, John was a big influence on me, you know. Uh, and my older, my two, I have two older brothers who were uh, into hard rock when they were young, and they used to listen to, like, you know, Aerosmith and Black Sabbath and nice. Deep Purple and stuff like that, Led Zeppelin. So that kind of, you know, that's where it all started. Then those guys got into disco. <laughs> and they... <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> they went down that path. They did, and they became Guidos uh, <laughs> oh, big wow. time. Matter of fact, my brother Vinny, that's right, I do have a brother whose name is Vinny. He had the whole, I mean, he had the, the gold chains. He had the Cadillacs with the spoke wheels. Oh, it's crazy! Oh man, this is like the, this <laughs> yeah. is like, we're talking late seventies, right? Or yeah, 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 in the early eighties, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, and then you know, my brother John, you know, he he was he started playing drums really young, I think around eight or nine, something like that, and we banging on pots the entire time. Finally, my mother got him like a little toy kit that he broke in like two days because he was hitting him so hard. <laughs> but I mean, he was a huge influence on me. And I, you know, I just used to sit and, you know, watch them practice all the time. And it's a shame because the guitar player, Walter Garces, he was like one of those guys who was just a natural, you know. The guy was, he, he sounded exactly like Michael Shanker. Uh, and he he should have he should have made it he should, really should have made it hmm. uh i'm not sure what what happened with him but the singer um one of their singers at the time was tony harnell and he went on to a band called tnt i don't know if you no I, it doesn't sound really ring a bell norwegian, norwegian metal band tnt mm -mm. yeah yeah, it doesn't ring. Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't know him. That's cool. And uh, yeah, and it's funny because after that, John went on to uh, they, Jackals broke up, and uh, John went on to play with, uh, I mean, to tech for Charlie Benanti from Anthrax. Mm. And you know, those guys had a great time on the road. And after John, you know, John auditioned for Exodus, got that. That's when I got the call for Anthrax for, to Guitar Tech for Scott, because they had so much fun on the road with John. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe his brother. Were, were, they were they disappointed after they got you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's sorry. Funny. You set that up. <laughs> I did. I did. Now he lived up to the reputation, right? I did. I was there for quite quite a few years maybe uh a few too many because i always wanted to play in a band and i was like man what am i doing i mean yeah this is fun and all it's cool but i want to play right so finally it was in 94 when i was back in la um i was like all right i'm gonna get into a band and my friend john monty was in town at the time he was from new jersey and he said, yeah, I'm playing with this band called Human Waste Project. Um, we want to come down and jam. I'm like, sure. Yeah, that'd be fun. So went down, jammed. A week later, I was in the band, and we started playing the, the club scene in L.A. <clears throat> and we, you know, took a while to break. We were playing all kinds of clubs. You were playing, playing with, like, with you played with, like, Corn and System of a Down, right? That was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we played, you know, the clubs early on with those guys. Um, but, I mean, it, it, it was quite a few years until anybody really took notice. And finally, Hollywood Records signed us. 
and uh, we got on, you know, we got our little break and we started, we had our first national tour opening for the Deftones. That's that cool. was pretty cool. Yeah. That is cool. And was that a, uh, was that a global tour or was it U.S. or? That was U.S. with, um, with the Deftones. And then we went to Europe with um, Taurus Satana and Cold Chamber hmm. twice. And we started to build, you know, following in, in uh, the U.K. Kerrang! fell in love with the band, especially the, uh, the singer Amy, Amy Echo. Was and, it a was it a metal band? Um, it was more eclectic than that. If anybody you know asked me what the band sounded like, I'd always be like, "Well, it's like Susie and the Banshees meets Nine Inch Nails meets Helmet." I guess hmm. throw that all together, and that's kind of what you have. That's cool. Yeah. That's so cool. yeah, we you know. We get, started getting a really good buzz in the UK. And then we went back to the States and Hollywood Records, I guess the format was changing there. So I, they didn't want a band called Human Waste Project on their label. Hmm. And hmm. Uh, they dropped us. That was their reason but because of the name? I think a lot of it was the name. Wow. Yeah. So we were uh, scheduled to play the very first OzFest in the UK. And we kind of paid our own way to get over there. And we did it. And that was one of the last gigs with the Human Waste Project. Because after that, Singer decided that she didn't really want to do that type of music anymore. She wanted to do something, I um, guess, a little bit more new wavy. So we came home, we did one last gig at the House of Blues in L.A., and that was it. So how did that new wavy thing work out for her? Uh, she did it pretty good. I mean, she did a band called The Start. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, you know, they did all right. It's pretty cool. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that um, Ross Robinson actually produced the Human Waste Project record. And Ross did, you know, like, he produced Limp Biscuit, Corn, Deftones. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a lot of fun at the time. He was a, a nut in the studio. He'd plug every pedal he could find in. Okay, let's try this. Let's try that. And I'm like, oh, shit. We didn't write any of it down. I'm like, how am I going to recreate this live? And Is that where I came in? That's where you came in, exactly. Like, man, we need... I remember the timeline, but I remember Human Waste Project, and then so you did the studio record, and then, and then came to me. Is that how it worked? I don't. Yep. Really remember. Yeah, that was it. Especially when we got our advance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course. There was money to pay for it then. Yeah, because I certainly didn't have the money to pay for it. Yeah, and then I did a rig for you. Yeah. I think so. That's when you guys first met. That was it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And where were you, Dave, then, at that time? <clears throat> what year was that? 98? No, before that. It's probably... Well, yeah, the record was 98. Yeah. Yeah. Or was it 97? God, I can't even remember. Now I'm going to have to look it up. <laughs> what building was I in? You remember? Was it Andy Brower's building? Um... Was it no it wasn't what was the uh, what was the building after andy browers well there was two stints in andy's then there was early andy's and then there was a building on chandler chandler on on, on, on chandler that like lofty kind of place yeah yeah that's where that's it was it. Okay. that's cool yeah. so around 97 98 that's cool. And then so you built a rack for him. Yeah, because we had to recreate all these sounds. I mean, that that band was very atmospheric. Mm. So a lot of delays, a lot of phasing and flanging, <laughs> univibe kind of stuff. 
No, no solos at all. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was did you have, more about did you have a flip movie. tremolo. I did. I did. I think I still have it somewhere. I can't I believe remember, I remember that. that. Like when you, I remember, I remember that thing sound sounded amazing into distorted amps. Oh, it was so staccato. Because it, 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 but it would almost vibrate the cabinet across the stage. <laughs> <laughs> what was it that called? Was cool. What kind of, what kind of? Uh... It was a guy tone flip tremolo pedal. Right. It was a tube tremolo pedal. Oh wow! Or the tube did something in it. I'm not sure what, but it did something. Um, it's a really good sounding tremolo, though. Super good. Yeah. I don't know if it's still made or not. I haven't looked in recent years, but uh, super cool. There you go. It's funny yeah. how I remember that. I remember the TC pedal well. Your J, the JCM two thousand. Yeah. And eight hundred. And the eight hundred together. What was the first one? First amp. You, first was it an eight hundred? Was the first? How did you believe? That was it. That oh. was the first thing, right? An original Jubilee? Yeah, it had yeah. to be. They didn't really re reissue it at that point. The TC pedal, and then later it was the DSL with an 800, right? Yes. It was the next band. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. That was the next band. That was actually Power Man. Yeah. The DSL and the 800. So, so, so the end of Human Waste Project, then what happened? Oh, so I was still in Human Waste Project. We got home, and uh, John's like, you know, he was playing in uh, White Zombie at the time, or Rob Zombie. I don't remember what it was. And he said, yeah, um, Rob's brother, Spider, they're looking to add a member to the band. Would you be interested? And I was doing just fine with Human Waste Project. I'm like, mm, I'm good. Plus, human, I mean, uh, Power Man at the time, well, their first, their earlier stuff, it, um, it was more like rap rock, kind mm -hmm. of like, you know, Beastie Boys-ish. And I really wasn't into that too much. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually recommended somebody else for the band, and I guess they never went down for the audition. Two weeks later, Human Waste Project broke up. Mm. so uh called up uh you guys still looking <laughs> to audition people and, and uh, they were and they sent me you know a demo of some of the new material i'm like oh this is different this is cool you know i had the, the space rock vibe mm -hmm. and uh this was heavier <laughs> i don't know if i ever heard that term space rock <laughs> But That's it does make saying. sense. Power Man was space rock. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's cool. And um, yeah, went down, auditioned, and I was jamming with those guys for like two weeks. And finally, I'm like, what's going on? And I'm like, am I in the band? Oh, yeah, you got the gig. I'm like, oh, thanks for telling me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. Well, you know, sometimes they're feeling you out, but that's cool. So did you know and, did you know any of those guys or you just recommended or didn't know any of those guys and uh, yeah I was like oh shit what's this gonna be like all right and yeah you know got the gig and I think it was like three months later we went into the studio with Sylvia Massey producing and Joe Bar Barisi engineered the record and we did it at Sunset Sound oh nice. Yeah. Any so we did some pre production. So interesting. Beforehand. So interesting you just said that. It's like Sylvia Massey producing and Joe Barisi just being the engineer. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. Like early days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was uh ninety eight. Yeah. And uh yeah, we we did some pre production beforehand and I got to write a, you know, a bunch of riffs and stuff and I got some of the heaviness out. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah that was uh tonight the stars revolt and that record went on to sell a million copies wow yeah that's awesome yeah and we did tons of touring on that and a lot of big tours a lot of fun tours i remember seeing the band on um definitely magazine covers 
Yeah. Yeah, and we did some, you know, TV shows like Jimmy Kimmel. And he toured with Pantera. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I'll never forget this. We, we brought this up a few times. I remember, I never forget when Mike came back from tour, he goes, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think my liver will ever be the same again. <laughs> <laughs> Every night. Goes, that was rough. <laughs> oh, man. It was rough. Every <laughs> night. And there was no getting away from it either. Dime right. back. Tempesta, let's go. Shots. Black tooth. I'm like, oh, where can I hide? <laughs> <laughs> but you, but you, how do you say no, right? You, you can't. Right. You can't say no. Not to dime bag. You, right. You could. Oh my god! If I were in the same shoes, I'd be like, yes, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> but every night. Wow. Yeah. Every night. Hey, that's awesome. So you got to tell us some stories. What was your? Uh, first impression of uh of Dimebag and and working with you know going on tour with those guys uh it was a party that's he brought the party and he just wanted everybody to have a good time super sweet guy you know just always on 10 right. larger than life that's awesome and yeah he was the best and it just it, it blew me away how the guy would drink but his playing was spot on every night. Amazing. Didn't affect him at all? Not at all. Not at all. Wow. It's amazing. Some guys are like that. He, uh, he surprised us one night. It was like the end of the tour. I don't know where he found this get up. He, he, he basically put together his own spacesuit. <laughs> and he got on stage with Power Man and, um, we did uh, Ain't Talking About Love, Van Halen. And he was, he was singing. In a spacesuit. Yes. Oh, man. I want, if that was on video, that would be amazing. It probably is somewhere. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Go to YouTube, guys. Check that out. <laughs> if you can find it. Oh, it's so good. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a shame what happened. But um, that's so that's so cool that you got to know him, um, and all those guys, you know, his brother Vinny Paul. I guess you got to know him as well. Yeah, I mean, all those guys were great. Yeah, they were great, and they're all from the same area, right? I mean, was he from uh, was he from New York or where was he from? No, they were from Dallas. Dallas, that's right. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's right. My and bad. Phil from New Orleans. Okay. Yeah. My bad. They all sound. They all seem like they were from New York. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's funny, man. Good times. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So, um, so then what yeah, happened after we, the first album, and then when you guys? Well, were... we did some pretty major tours. I mean, uh, toured with Corn. We toured with Papa Roach. We toured with Kid Rock. Toured with Metallica. Summer Sanitarium tour. That was pretty amazing. Wow. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, playing in in front of huge audiences every night it was pretty amazing. Um, I can imagine. I'm trying to think of some of the other tours we did. I mean, it was yeah. So you got, uh, you got to know those guys as well, the Metallica dude. No, not really. Right. No, because they, you know, every all the other bands on the tour would. Um, come out like you know have tour buses but metallica would fly so they'd fly into the gigs and mm -hmm. you know be in and out i mean got to know i've known kirk for a little bit through you know some of the anthrax guys mm -hmm. um and he you know he was super friendly the other guys and robert trujillo he's the best he's just like yeah hey, what's up oh, he's a sweetheart isn't he yeah that's what i hear i hear he's a i good see dude. him I see him every year at Cantrell's birthday party. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I heard he was at the last one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, he, he was. he's been at a few of them. Um, I missed the last one. I was out of town. I actually got to play on stage with Metallica. Wow. Minus, oh, yeah. minus James. Oh, yeah. What James hurt himself on the tour. Apparently, he was jet skiing and... 
hurt himself. So uh, all the guitar players on that tour would uh, fill in for like a few songs. Hmm. Yeah. So he so, was he still was he still performing like just singing? He or wasn't I, even there. He no. wasn't even there. Oh wow. Okay. No. So I got to play Enter Sandman through James's rig. Who sings? Then? Uh, it was all different guys singing. I think Kid Rock sang on that one. Oh wow. <laughs> oh, oh, um, Jason Newstead was singing a lot of the, a lot of the songs. Wow. Yeah. So. Really. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, you have to play through the rig. I know. I still thought my rig sounded better. Uh, <laughs> what was the rig at the time? Um, he was, Mesas? Mesa boogies? Mm, well, he was using diesels hmm. and and the uh, the Mesa preamp, the triaxis. Oh, yeah, both. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So I'm not sure what was happening at the time what i was using you know they were just like here go so you probably have no interest in playing through the rig currently uh what is no. it what is it axe effects yeah <laughs> yeah i can't believe it man yeah that is crazy that is crazy meanwhile it doesn't sound good anymore with them i i mean i've, I've heard them live now it's just like yeah this just, it just doesn't sound great i mean I mean, it's okay, but are they just it's trying okay. to save money? Is it a money money thing? They just yeah, a band that big is trying to save a few dollars. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what? What? Why would they? You know what I find, here's what I find kind of funny about that. I mean, in some instances, that stuff's great, you know, because it does save people money and and all that. But often, bands like that, the rigs they build around that are quite large in themselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's like there's power amps and multiple axe effects and this whole it's a 20 space rack and it's right <laughs> on. Is it really that much less stuff? <laughs> I think it's more about consistency night after night. With the sound. I can see that. But it doesn't sound so good. Yeah, it's, I don't know. No, it doesn't. It just sounds kind of toyish. No, I don't know. I, it sounds like they, you know, lost the punch. Yeah, that's what's missing, the weight. Yes. The, the percussive weight of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, like, the tone is similar and, and all that, but the percussive weight isn't there. And that's what I noticed seeing, seeing bands um, live that use modelers more. It, the, the weight isn't there. It's not there. And I've seen bands on the same bill that... You know, one is using real amps and one are using modelers. It's not that the modelers sound bad or necessarily, but it's just that there's a weight and a punch that's not clear there. I agree. I yeah. mean, fractals, Kempers, they have their place. And I that's get it. I get the place. convenience yeah. of it all. It's, they're cool. But I don't think anything will ever replace a real tube amp. Tone-wise and feel-wise, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I don't know. As long as they're around and people get to try them, they're going to know the difference and be able to feel it. And I think most guitar players will end up picking a, an amp over the modeling tone, at least for me. I mean, you, I've gone back and forth. I've been, you know, look, I mean, I'm sure we all have and tried it out of curiosity and be like, oh, let me give it a shot. But I always go back to a tube amp. Always. Always. Yeah. I gotta say, even like some of the plugins these days have gotten so good. You know, some of the universal audio plugins. But you record that plugin and then you record a real amp. It's like yep. two dimensional, three dimensional. It, it's it, and it's it, what's that, Dave? It's different. Yep, it's a little different. Yeah, but hey, they're still there's they're cool. But so. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so let let's keep going. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I wanna I wanna lead up to. Uh, it sounds just like your park. What what sounds like my park? I'm sure there's a plug-in that sounds just like your park. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> what year is your park? That sounds pretty damn good. What year? I is resurrected it? park for him. Yeah, I have a 1970 Park 75. 
Mm. Um, George Lynch sent me on that quest because he actually let me borrow his main Park 75 for a while. Mm. He's like, here, check it out. Amazing. And it was great. (laughs) So I'm like, oh, shit. Well, I guess I need to find one. And I was looking for a while. And uh, Mitch Colby, who, you know, resurrected the park Mm. name. uh, I've known Mitch forever. I was asking him, and uh, he uh, he has a bunch of vintage parks still. Right. And he, he happened to find a uh, a seventy small box parks uh, small box park seventy five, and he didn't want to let it go, but I kept nagging him and nagging him, and nagging. Him. Finally, finally, <laughs> I got it. Nice. And I brought it to Dave for some tweaks to make it a little bit more aggressive. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Nice. And uh, we had my amp and George's amp on the bench at the same time. And uh, they were almost like Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really? That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. And does is does George's have the same mod or is his just naturally like that? It's not really mods per se. It's more making them just super lead specs. Mm. Uh, Park 75 originally wasn't... Uh, wasn't exactly a super lead spec and it was had kt 88s i think originally in it or or something like that and Mm -hmm. uh it was a little cleaner and not quite you know as bright and percussive as as a super lead spec would be so it's just a few little parts you know and really a 75 they only call this 75 because they put bigger power tubes in it it really is a it's a 50 watt it's a standard 50 watt Mm. Marshall per se um it's just uh you put el34s in it and then it's a 50 watt so i was basically say so the one the one of the changes is putting el34s from the kt88s yeah 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 the only reason they call this 75 is they put the kt88s in it and the, I, that gives a little bit more power before breakup i mean a, a 50 watt marshall is really more like 60 watts anyway mm-hmm. so I'm not sure really 75. That might be pushing the, uh, the what it really could do. <laughs> Where they just they just named the park 75, but it really. I but they just uh, yeah I mean they just put the higher headroom tubes in it and slightly different circuit, but right. not much. It's essentially the same transformers that go in a 50 watt Marshall like old Marshall. So. And then they're not as expensive as uh, Marshall Plexi, so. Yeah. Score look, look. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Score big time. Where do you think I stole the whole offset thing from? Oh really? You know the whole offset thing in my amps with the logos on the left, it all came from parks. Because I always thought parks were cool. Yeah. They are, I remember they you were. had a park one fifty years ago. Did a Soldano modded park one fifty. I wanted Ooh. to buy it at the time, but I didn't. And it was, George I Tripp's read that. had it. Oh, he does? I think he still has it. Wow. Yeah. From way so, huge. George yeah. Tricks. He also had a Park 45 I had, too. That I sold him years ago. That's cool. Awesome. So, uh, so let's keep going with you, Mike. I'm <laughs> curious. I, I really want to lead up to... Uh, so, so Power Man 5000, how did things go um, leading into the well, second th- album? Things were going great. They really were. And then, you know, we started writing a second record. And we, we wrote a heavier record. Uh, it was darker. And we were all done with it. And we were about to release it. We even had a whole tour booked. And, of course, last minute... The uh, A and R guy comes down, listens to it, and he's like, "You know what? I'm not really hearing too many singles. You guys are gonna have to go back in and write, an, you know, some more stuff." And that was like the beginning of the end for the uh, for that band, really, because soon after that, um, I think it was Dorian, the bass player, left. And 
and then Al decided to leave the drummer. It was one, either vice versa. I can't remember who left first. So basically, we had to find a new band, mm. and that record was shelved. And we had to write a new rec, a whole new record. So two years went by. Um, found new members, wrote a new record, but the momentum of the band mm. stopped. You know. So you know, we got back out released that um that record and went back on a tour uh things were going okay but not great and then dreamworks decided they weren't going to support the the tour anymore and the band kind of fell apart well no it didn't actually um i was home uh and I found out that they had a show booked in Hollywood that I didn't know about. <laughs> really? <laughs> so I called Spider. I'm like, what's going on here? And he goes, well, you know, I, I, I felt like on that last tour run that you really weren't into it that much anymore and you didn't want to be in the band. I'm like, what? <laughs> so... Yeah, I was basically booted out of the band, you know, and uh, didn't know about it. Oh man, so. I, I had that happen to me. That's almost that's almost like the Jakey Lee story. Which of him, one of, of of him getting fired from Ozzy? <laughs> well, yeah, oh, he, he didn't know about it. He didn't know he about it either. Aaron. <laughs> Everybody else was telling him about it. Oh, did you hear? We heard you got fired. He's like, I was just with Sharon and. For dinner and she didn't tell me that so they called her up and then she was like oh yeah I, had, I didn't have the heart to tell you that you're fired oh man can you imagine oh. but the worst the worst firing was when he told me to, when he told he didn't tell us he told uh another podcast about the firing of the bass player um yeah we brought that up at our dinner the other night we had with him um the firing of Don Costa. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yes. That is just That's like bad. That is just horrible. Bring his family to the Us Festival. Uh, I mean that is just insane. Like why how do you do that to somebody? Good one. <laughs> and then Bob Baisley's there, like warming up and stuff, like Really? Wow. Yeah, that's brutal. That's brutal. <laughs> So, but anyway, um, actually, it's you, know, you want to hear an interesting quick story just to make it about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had a band. I was in New York. We were playing. Um, maybe you know about this place in New York City. I, I was there in the, the early 90s. Um, Giorgio Gamelski. Does that name sound familiar? He, produ yeah. he uh, actually was the manager of the Yardbirds early wow. in the days with uh, Clapton and Beck and, and, uh, and, and Paige. Um, and then he went on, he actually worked with the Stones early on, but he owned this building in New York City on like, God, I can't remember. It was like 20, 28th Street, 24th Street, something like that, between 6th and 7th Avenue. And uh, I would practice there with my band all the time. Um, and he, he owned this building and he lived right on the top floor of the building. Uh, it was like a small, skinny building, and it was painted red, or the doors were red, if I remember correctly. Um, and there was a band that played there. Uh, God, now I'm totally drawing a blank of the of the band. But anyway, long story short, um, I I went around to the guys in my band, and I, I didn't think the singer was working out. So I went to the guys in my band, and I said, you know, we really need to get another singer. Um, we, we should really consider getting another singer and blah, 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 blah. And everybody was like, yeah, you know, maybe you're right, you know. And then I go to practice like a week later and they totally like it all backfired on me and they fi ended up like, uh, yes. you know, you, you, you said that you wanted a new singer. Well, we think we need a new drummer. <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's great. great. That, so that, that didn't work out very well for me. Um, so I was like, Okay, all right, I'll leave. Uh, you know, it didn't work out, but yeah, that was great. That was crazy. 
uh, so I ended up going back. It all worked. Everything works out for a reason, right? So it does. That's how I believe because uh, that led to a whole bunch of stuff. So me ended up, ended up going going to college, graduated college, a whole bunch of other shit. So, but anyway, so tell tell me about you, Mike. Cause so, uh, well, so when did you? Well, that's start- kind of how I feel. You know, it's like all the different chapters in my life. You know. Yeah, every kind of everything I think happens for a reason. Yeah, yeah. or at least hopefully. Not when bad, not when bad things happen. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Most of the time, when bad things happen, people are like, oh, "That didn't happen for a reason." Um, but I mean, I, I got to say, on that tour, I was getting a little, yeah, I, you know, I wasn't getting along with certain members in the band. I actually got into a fist fight with one of the guys, oh. you know, on the tour bus, and uh, yeah, I it was like, uh, I don't know if I could deal with this guy anymore, and it was almost like a blessing in disguise. Mm really was um and then what uh, happened after my, that my 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 now wife who was a girlfriend at the time she had moved out from new jersey and um i was like you know what i want to be home anyway i want to start a family mm. and kind of kind of work out the way it should right yeah exactly yeah i think i think that's the way things happen i mean even though at the time it was like wow i didn't see that coming Right. So uh, th- that's a bit disappointing, but yeah, that's cool. So then, what was the next step after that? So you were you were home with the family, having having some kids. And... Well, we didn't we didn't have any children then. It was just you know us two, and I'm like, oh boy. And she was new to L. A. And what am I gonna do now? Right. Mm. And I'm like, shit. What am I gonna do now? <laughs> <laughs> so I I started making some calls to people in the industry, like looking for work because there was no gigs at that time. I couldn't find any, any gigs. Um, so I started asking around and I, I called Evan Scott from Seymour Duncan mm. and he's like, you know, I think, uh, Yamaha is looking to hire somebody in artist relations. I'm like Yamaha. Huh? All right. Well, I, yeah, I think you talked to me about this too. Oh, uh, did I? Um, yeah. And I think I recommended you. <laughs> uh. That's funny. I was like a little corporate, but I guess I don't know. Um, so that was my uh, stepping stone right there, you know, into into artist relations. And at the time, Yamaha was focusing on electric guitars, and they wanted hard rock metal guys. So I started, you know, getting some good players for them, mm. and uh, built up a reputation there. And that lasted, oh God, how many years was that? Six wow. or seven, seven years doing that. And then I got a call from um, Nick Bocott, who was, you know, he was at Marshall forever, Marshall Amps, and, but then he went over to Jackson and he's like, I'm going to go back to Marshall. He goes, oh, I'm, I want to recommend you for this gig over here. Are you interested? I'm like, am I interested? Jackson Charvel, EVH. I, I grew up on Jackson Charvel, right. and I always love those guitars. And you yeah. love, and you love EVH, so. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, it was like a dream gig, wow. and uh, yeah, he put the recommendation in and uh, met. Met with you know some of the higher ups at uh, Fender FMIC and got the gig and here I am. And eight long- years, eight, going on going on nine years now. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. And uh, I can imagine going from um, Yamaha to the artist roster with those you know with those companies a big big shift. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. At the time when I first joined Jackson, it, there was a lot of like. Uh, uh, a lot of like I, I don't know Norwegian metal stuff like that. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely on the darker, heavier side. Um, right, right. And uh, it seems to have a- expanded over the last eight years. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we got Still quite a roster now. <laughs> I, I hope so. I mean, I won't say it's just me, but yeah, I I think I had a, a big part in what's going on today. As far as the artist roster, yeah, I mean, you guys are adding some really cool people. I've seen, oh yeah, you know, 
yeah. even like some in, you know like in, like Instagram stars or you know like YouTube type people you know like that I saw Cameron Brown with uh, mm -hmm. EVH which was pretty cool yeah uh, yeah so so how do how do you guys like determine who you will pick as an artist like what's the I'm sure that's like one of the biggest questions you get like you know like what 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 can I do to become an artist for EVH or I mean with with our artist roster it's more quality not quantity because there's other companies that are giving any it seems like anybody a signature model mm -hmm. and we we are looking for a certain type of player the cream of the crop the best of the best and you know you look at all of the guys on a roster they can all play they're serious players mm -hmm. they, they're not hacking it they're not they're not calling it in so i mean that's what we we look for right exactly right. yeah well, you, that, you have to expect that, right? So, um, are you guys? So, I've looked on like uh, on the EVH uh, website for like the roster and stuff, and it's not on there. Like, are you guys redoing that, or what, what's the? We are. Yeah, it gets well, out of hand after a while, doesn't it? it, it <laughs> you you have a roster up, and you have all this stuff, and then all these people get added, and then you lose track. Yeah. Like, wait a minute. There's yeah. a bunch of people I know aren't on our list, and they should be. And <laughs> yeah, the Char the Jackson website was uh, redone last year, and we're uh, we're still adding artist profiles to that. And the uh, Charvel and EVH websites will be undergoing a, a facelift as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that, they're, they're not there right now, right? No. Right. That's cool. Gotcha. So. Um, so as part of your job, it's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, can you ex describe like what, what you, you know, what you're responsible for? I'd be really what curious. Yeah. What, I'm <laughs> curious. I'm curious as part of, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you, you are working with the artist, but I'm just curious, like what, what's, you know, b behind like your everyday work and what do you do? Honestly, it changes every day. Um, sometimes it could be work, you know, I, I work hand in hand with marketing so it's, sometimes it's ads for magazines, yeah. um, social media. Sometimes it's working on clinics. Sometimes it's just putting in orders for gear or uh, specking out artist models, which I help with. Mm. I mean, we have our product managers who focus on that, but I work directly with the artists on the specs for the, for the models. Um, you know gathering photos bios it, it changes every day right right that's cool um that, i have the best job in the world i was gonna say it sounds freaking cool man <laughs> it's better than my job that's for sure <laughs> uh, at least it sounds more interesting um do you work with eddie van halen have you worked with and on his models of guitars and stuff like that yeah mm -hmm. and that's surreal I mean, here's a guy who I worshipped, you know, mm. still do the yeah. best. And there he is, you know, a couple of feet away from me. And guy gives me a cup, kisses me on the cheek when he sees me. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. It's like, this is Eddie Van Halen. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's... And you know what? He still, he tests every piece of, like every prototype, every model that's introduced he has to see it. He has to play it. He has to check it out. Yeah, I mean, I've seen his signatures on the, the models at, at NAM. Mm hmm Yeah, he signs off on everything. Mm -hmm. so. That's super cool. He, yeah. He tests everything. He's, he's, not, he's not fooling around. No joke there. So I, I have to ask you as a fan and as somebody who's a, a big EVH you know, I, I support the brand. I've, you know, you probably see one of the amps back there. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I. So, are they coming out with more, or do you know if is there a reason why they don't come out with more like translucent colors on the on the Wolfgang models, like on the USA models? I'm curious. Um, I think anytime Van Halen does go out on tour and does something, it sparks 
sales for certain models. Mm -hmm. And the last couple of times, you know, it was either the white guitar, the white wolf gang or the stealth black. Mm. And those are the big sellers. The other ones, I mean, they, they, they do well, but, um, not as good as the stealth or the white. So I think that's why it's so limited. Um, we have introduced new colors for the import models. Yeah, and they're great. They're definitely awesome. And there's uh, there's definitely you know, a really good reception to those as well, especially oh, yeah. the new ones with like the roasted maple necks. Those are super. Yeah, I saw them. They yeah. they look great. Of course, the shark was was super cool. Oh yeah. Yeah, and the shark. Everybody goes nuts over the shark. I want one. I I want to get one. <laughs> and the seventy eight. Well, that. That was gone in a heartbeat. Yeah, that was gone. Yeah. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question that uh, pop just popped in my head because this has happened like two or three years in a row before Nam, like like a month or two before Nam, something happens on the EVH website and like the new model pops up on the website like pre and like people it all of a sudden the 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 interwebs go nuts. Everybody's like, hey, did you see, did you see that EVH has put the shark on there? But it's got like it's missing some information or like the, I'm just curious, like what what happens there? How, how does that happen? Is that like just a just a mistake? Is that like marketing makes a mistake or or is or is it an intention? Could, could be intentional. Right. I'm just saying I don't, well, it's, a, it's a bit interesting. You know, I'm like, how'd that get leaked? Could <laughs> be know? a little bit of a teaser. Right. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Yeah. Because I was like, that's super. You know, like I, that happened on the shark, and then it also happened on the fifty one fifty. I think. And yeah. yeah. And people were like, mm -hmm. ah, you know. <laughs> so. Matter of fact, Joe Bonamassa's tech. I think that the same day that happened, he texted me, Mike Hickey. Mike Hickey. Yeah, yeah. he's a Van Halen nut. He's like, you guys are putting out the shark. I'm like. What are you talking about? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And he's like, uh huh, sure. <laughs> yep. So but he uh, did eventually buy one. There you go. Yeah, uh, I would. Yeah, I'm sure they're doing pretty well. And yeah, and then the roasted neck stuff is cool. And then so as part, those are specialty brands for Fender. But I noticed right. like like Gretsch is not part of your purview you know but that's a specialty brand for for fender is it you know i'm just cur curious why that's not is that handled by somebody else it's handled by somebody else handled by mike taft um who used to work at ibanez oh, okay but i did the gretch project malcolm young oh. guitar oh <laughs> nice. yep. well tell us about that that was a project that was started, um, I think it was on the Black Ice Tour. They actually made Malcolm a couple of prototypes, um, FMIC, you know, and he actually, he signed off on the guitar. He, he, he never played anything else except his number one and maybe the White Falcon occasionally. Mm -hmm. And um, he signed off on the guitar. He actually played it. The, the, one of the prototypes, he played it live. He was like, this thing's amazing. I wasn't around at the time. Um, but after that tour, everything went dark. So nobody could find out any information, what was going on, you know, what's going on with this model. There was nothing, no communication. So, you know, and then the news came out about Malcolm. Right. On the, the last tour they did, I found out that they were rehearsing close by to where I work. And I was, I've been friends with Takumi, the guitar tech, for years. He used to tech for uh, Angus. Mm -hmm. And he told me that, you know, Trace Foster is now working for them, and he's uh, Stevie Young's tech. I'm like, we need to release that Malcolm model. I mean... It's for the fans. Right. Anybody who's a fan of ACDC, this guitar needs to be out there. It needs to be right. And he, uh, he, he, uh, Takumi hooked me up with Trace. 
I went down to the rehearsal uh, studio and we, you know, he, after talking, he saw that I was a, a big fan. It wasn't a money grab. It was legit. Mm. And um, he set up a meeting with Angus. And I was like, oh, man, this is crazy. Yeah, so, that is crazy. That's yeah. Crazy. Just sat down with with Angus, Stevie, and, and Trace, Trace Foster. and That's awesome. At first, you know, it was a little like Angus was, you know, kind of eyeballing me. Right. Like, yeah, what's this all about? But then, you know, he could tell after speaking that it was from the heart. Because I'm a huge ACDC fan. Me too. And I just want to see this guitar be released. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, got the sign off from him. And uh, Stephen Stern made a couple of prototypes. There was a couple of changes, a uh, couple of spec changes. And uh, we got the sign off and guitar was released. And now everybody's happy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've, I've seen some great people playing them. I was just thinking. I just saw somebody. It was a uh, God who was who was playing it. it. Wasn't John Mayer? I can't remember who was playing the, the Angus model, but it was somebody in a big band. But yeah, they're... Scott Ian did a a, a product video for us. For that oh, really? model. It's a great video too, because he's such a huge fan. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, big time, right? <laughs> yeah, he's got some tattoos of uh, Angus and Malcolm. Yeah. On Does he? Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's all. Awesome. That's killer. Yeah. yeah, he, um, you know, I, I, Angus gets all the, the credit, but Malcolm. Oh my God. Yeah. I wish there was, a, I, I don't know, is there a way, Dave, or maybe Mike, you know as well, uh, to separate their, do they have them left and right? I forget. Or, um, or do they just have them blended? Because it's sometimes, it's always, I always have a hard time hearing them, but when you see them live, and you know, it's insane. Yeah, and then you see him. I, I've seen ACDC live twice, and I did see him with Malcolm. So, you know, he was amazing. I was like on his side of the stage, and that's when I really got full appreciation for him. But, but uh, on the on the album, sometimes I have a hard time deciphering what's going on. Yeah, I think it might be a blend of the sounds. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of the earlier records it was left and right. I I, I don't I, I I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I'm sure that there's some ACDC fanatics out there who could chime in on that. Yeah, we'll get to the chat too in just a little bit. Um, but uh, but I did get to play through that rig. Oh I, really? Just a, just a couple of chords, but uh, Do you still on. have your teeth? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the loudest thing ever. Oh my god! And you know what's funny? It's like they have all those Marshall cabs on stage and usually most bands are dummy cabs. Every one of those cabs on stage is plugged in. Every one. Really? It's like a jet engine going off. It's insane. Wow. Hey, you hit one, get one chord and your teeth fall out. Oh. <laughs> the best, but Malcolm's sound was surprisingly clean, clean and loud. Like you really had to smack the guitar to get that break up. Mm. Really smack it. Interesting. I guess that's why uh, he uses those heavy strings or use those heavy strings just to really dig in. So Sher Buell says left and right for Angus and Malcolm and solos in center. Hmm. Ah, there it is. I'll have to check that out. People check that out. Yeah, yeah, because I... Uh, you know, meanwhile, I, I've got these really cool uh, Yamaha monitors, and I don't know how to separate from left and right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I need a, I, I need to get a new uh, interface. That's gonna something I'm gonna do this weekend, actually. Dave, do you recommend one? Like a recording interface? Yeah, like right now I've got U, this, this UA UA Apollo little the small UA. One, okay. I was I was looking I, at the. It's great. Yeah. yeah, it's great. Okay, I'm done. It's not, it's not that bad. It's a, I mean, it's a little bit of money, but it's not that bad. Well, what's a little bit of money? I forgot. I have to look. <laughs> I mean, they're they're usually like 150 bucks or something. The smaller ones. Oh no, no, it's more than that. 
Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll look it up. The it's one more I... of a pro interface. So. Oh, good. All right, well, then I need something like that because this thing is just crap. And I put and even my phone. If I just like run my phone near it, it's just like starts so making all this noise. And what is it? What do you have there? It's a uh, pre Sonus. Oh, that's not that bad. It's really bad. Really? The audio box USB. Yeah. I mean, I don't. It's. I've had it for several years, and I think it just needs to go. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, that's that's a great job, man. Work. You know, and I I've. I've met you, uh, I think, one, once or twice at NAM before, but I, I know at NAM, as Dave has said, it's just like a sea of people coming to, oh coming at you, and it's I, just. I swear to God, sometimes at NAM, I'll be like someone. Someone will come up to me later, and so yeah, I talked to you at NAM. I'm like, I, or I ask them, well, "Were you there?" And I go, "Yeah, I talked to you for a while." <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. did. Yeah. I know. You can't oh. take a you can't take offense to that because it's just Shoot. insane. I yeah. didn't even remember I talked to the guy from the Struts at Nam. <laughs> I, I mean, I remember now, but it, it took me a minute to rem actually remember that I had a conversation with him. <laughs> <laughs> that had to be towards the uh, like, latter part of the day. It doesn't matter what part of the day. It has nothing to do with the amount of liquor we're drinking. It has more to do with the amount of people you talk to. It's you know, it's just... yeah. Because generally, we're not. Even though, even though we have the bar in the booth, we're we're generally not drunk, like drunk, drunk. You know, it's just like we're no. generally. Just... Well, you got too much to do. You you're can't... standing there all day. And you're talking to people all day. It's like you, you don't even have time to totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and yeah. your adrenaline's up. Also, your adrenaline's up. You're fine. You're good. You get a little numb after a while. Yeah, totally numb. Yeah. I mean, literally, like it, it's like every two seconds, someone is trying to grab you mm -hmm. and you know and talk to you. And you, you sometimes are just like, I need a break for a second. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go somewhere for a minute. <laughs> I'm gonna walk oh, around. Yeah. Thing. yeah, you almost need like a, a minute of lo alone time. At least for me, I've had yeah. that, those moments where I'm like, I'm going to go walk, walk outside and just be like by myself for a second. That's why occasionally in our sound room, there'll be a lull, like like everyone will leave after something and it'll be quiet or no one in there for a second. Mm -hmm. It's like, hurry, lock the door. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hurry, lock the door. Let, let's lock the door for 10 minutes. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, yeah, I know. Just to have a break because it, no it is... So you look forward to, to Nam, Mike, or or is it kind of like, you know, like what's your what's your prep up to Nam? <laughs> I did. Is it is it madness leading up to Nam with for you, or or is that it's, more like is yeah, that usually because I I set up a lot of artist signings, mm. you know, and oh. yeah, and I book all of the the travel too for the artists coming in. So it's it's a lot to coordinate and all right, who's coming in at what time and. Mm -hmm. And getting artists together because I, I would do group signings too. It's like herding cats. <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah, yeah just to then, get everybody to show up at the same time. You'll get the artist going. Oh, I, I really don't want to sign with them. Oh, I make sure of Have that. You had beforehand. that. I, I I make sure of that beforehand. I've had that at the last second being told that. Oh man. Oh, that's not cool. No. Oh, we won't say who, but <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah, but I can see how that can that can be a problem. Some people just don't mix well. Yeah. So yeah, some guys just want to sign solo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had last last year it was Cantrell in the booth. That was that was a good signing. Yeah, I'm actually, sure it was a great although, turnout. Although he wasn't there long enough. How long? Really? We had forty five minutes. That's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we there must it. be a lot of disappointed people. Yeah, I think we stretched it to maybe an hour. But but then he was going to a different booth, so we just sent everyone there. Ah, there you <laughs> go. Yeah. Um, Cantrell. I, I actually... I checked him on the facelift tour. Oh, really? So let's yeah, talk about that. about that. Speaking of Bogner Fish preamp and VHT power amp, mm -hmm. that's what he was using back then. Oh, really? Yeah. The Bogner fish. Yep. Yeah. 
and his G and L guitars, which he's still playing today. Um, I actually met those guys on the um, Clash of the Titans tour with Slayer, Megadeth, Anthrax, and Alice in Chains opened. And nobody knew who they were. I mean, right. this was a thrash tour. And Alice in Chains would come out and people would just start throwing things at them. I mean, it was brutal. It was brutal. But they turned out to be the biggest band of them all. <laughs> out of all those bands. Yeah. You know? No doubt. And I mean, those other bands are big, but Alice in Chains seemed to kind of eclipse. Yeah. But uh, on that tour, it was funny. You know, I hung out with them, got to meet them, and pretty... Uh, everybody thinks, oh, God, what a dark, grungy band. They were the funniest guys ever. I mean, especially the drummer, man. He was so funny. And Lane. Lane, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate the drugs, you know, got the most of them. Because there were some dark moments on tour. I'm like, oh, boy. Oh, really? It's pretty scary. Scary, yeah. Just seeing him in, you know, just that, it was bad. That state, yeah. Yeah. It's too bad. But a lot of good times as well. That's good. Fun. Yeah, and and um, when I was working with them, they were opening for Van Halen on this huge arena tour. Oh wow! I saw that tour. And that's where I met Matt Brook the first time. Matt Brooke was teching for Eddie. Oh, wow. So this is like, all, it's all connections. I mean, the, you know, all these little touch points that led you yeah. to this job, you know, because now right. I'm sure you work with Matt closely, I'd imagine, right? All the time. That yeah. was the fuck tour, wasn't it? Pound cake tour. Pound cake? Well, yeah, I think it wasn't that. That was, yeah. he was using PVs then. He was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was... Yeah, that was that tour. Pretty sure. That's so, that's so cool. So, um, what was your interaction with the band then? With uh, with Van Halen, Van Halen yeah. <laughs> I just remember this one time, Eddie busting into Alice's dressing room, grabbing a ketchup bottle and just squirting it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Just out of the yeah, blue. I didn't see those guys much. Another band that was kind of in and out, really, you know, came to play the gig and then they bust out. Mm-hmm. But sometimes Eddie would come into the dressing room. Was he looking for the liquor? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the, what was the story? Uh, there was a story when when uh, Vince Neil opened up for for Van Halen, and they were trying to keep Ed sober. Ed would come into their dressing rooms and drink the liquor. <laughs> Oops. So. <laughs> that didn't work. They said they would drink them out of the liquor. <laughs> and when I was at Yamaha, I actually worked with Michael Anthony. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, he had a signature model with them at the time. And and I'd go out. What was that, that last run that they did where – it was, you know, Michael, Sammy, and Eddie. That was a weird uh, a vibe. That was a weird one. Yeah. That's when I first had done his rig. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. That was... That, a, that 2004, was, was it, or something? I say 2004. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the last Sammy or excursion. Lead, yeah, or leading up to it may have been 2003, but yeah. yeah. That, was, that, was, that was an interesting era. Mm-hmm. Well, that was interesting. Not, that was not a good era. <laughs> no. You said that. I mean. But Michael, my God, the sweetest guy. He's great. He's a nice guy. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I went to go see Michael. His his signing at PV was at the same time as Jerry's at NAM. So I was like, oh, it was Sophie's choice, man. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, really. I was like, oh, well, who do I pick? You know, and I, I ultimately I was like, Van Halen wins, man. I'm like Michael Anthony. <laughs> if I have to make the choice, it's always going to be Van Halen, no matter what. So uh, that's where I headed. Even though I met him last year as well, so I figured I'll meet Jerry one one day, hopefully. Um, 
Yeah, man, that's super cool. That's super cool to uh, to have been on tour with those guys. Um, yeah, it trips me out a bit, you know, especially again working for the brands that I represent. Jackson Travel EVH. I remember as a kid, I'd go down to 48th Street in New York, and uh, I'd bug Jose Ferro, who was a salesperson at the time at Sam Ash, and Jose went on to become like VP of ESP or something. Yeah, I worked uh, for Fry. I worked for VHT for a long time, and then he was, uh, then he was, uh, yeah, then he went to ESP, and then he and, was forever. Yeah, and I'd, I'd go down there every weekend, 48th Street, with my, my, my two friends, Marzio Trupo and Victor Abandonado. Nice. And I still hang out with those. Those are some guys. New York names. I was going to say, Italian New York names. They, they actually came out to NAM last year for the first time, and they were like kids in a candy store. I took them out to dinner with uh, Jakey Lee and Warren D. Martini. It was like, ooh. Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we used to go down to 48th Street every weekend, and um, I just I would see all these custom Jacksons and Charvels on the wall and just drool. I mean, it, and Randy Rhodes, I mean, he was like my idol too. And he, you know, to, just to be working here now, representing these brands and working with the Rhodes family, working with Van Halen, working with Jake, working with Warren, it trips me out. Yeah, I mean, I was just about, I mean, I have a list of questions for you, but I know a bunch of other people have questions for you in the chat. But, uh, I mean, working with Warren on on his stuff must have been so cool on his, uh, his you know, uh, signature guitars as well as Jakey e. Lee's, you know, guitars that just... Oh, yeah. Can you tell us about some of the, the process of how you go about doing that with, with those artists? I mean, do they come to you? Do you guys go to them about their, their, their models or... You know, it's funny, um, Jakey e. Lee, I was, I think Jason Hook from Five Finger Death Punch, I was emailing with him at the time because he was interested in purchasing an EVH Wolfgang, and he's like, yeah, you know, and he moved to Vegas, and he's like, you know who's in the studio next door? Jakey e. Lee. I'm like, what? Jakey e. Lee? Like, I mean, Jakey e. Lee was... Like, nobody knew where the guy was for years, you know? I'm like, he's in the studio next door. What? I, like, you have to put me in touch with him. Mm. I, 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 he needs a Charvel signature model. And we, uh, he, he did. He put me in touch with Ron, the bass player at the time, who had the studio where Jake was recording, and... Ron kind of put it together. I flew out with Michael McGregor, who was the uh, Charvel brand manager at the time. And we met with Jake. And Jake was kind of a recluse. And he really, he didn't, even now, he doesn't give a shit. He didn't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. But we kind of talked him into it. And now we're like best pals. You know, it's crazy. Went out to dinner with him the other night. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, Friedman had a, a grand of a time with him a, about a month ago in Vegas. Oh, oh I know. Yes. Everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> that was the big interview. Yeah. That was the big, uh, yeah. Was that thing broke, interview. that actually broke blabbermouth and all kinds of news. Oh, yeah. yeah. We talked about that a little uh, Wednesday. Did you? Yeah. Can you say what he said? What was his? He doesn't give he didn't give a fuck what he said. <laughs> well, it's all true, though. It's all true. You know what? Because I'm going to defend Jakey e. Lee because uh, there were people who were like, especially on the blabbermouth site and everything, they were like, oh, fuck Jakey e. Lee. You know, he's, he's just bringing up bullshit. Um, he said it in a magazine, in Kerrang! magazine, back in the 80s about Motley Crue asking him to be in the band. So I was like... It's truth. It, Early he's, 80s. He's not like, long, right he, when he got the Aussie gig. Yeah. Nicky Lee speaks the truth. You hear that, Nikki Six? Yeah, man. I don't, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> the gauntlet has been thrown down. Yeah. No, seriously. I mean, that, that, why it's would the guy print. lie? Yeah. It's in yeah. print. Exactly. Someone sent that to me. I was like, 
All right. Well, then, you know, that, that corroborates it right there. I mean, the guy said it many years ago. So, um, but he's a cool I dude. Kind of, I remember, I kind of remember reading that article myself, too. Mm. And I was like, no, I don't want him to join Motley Crue. He's great with uh, Ozzy, you know? Mm -hmm. You can't. Yeah, that would, have, that would have been weird. That would have been weird, definitely. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so so tell so what happened after that? So after you you got in touch with him and he agreed, um, how, yeah. How, so Chip Chip Ellis built him uh, some guitars that are interesting spec. I mean, the production model, the white guitar, it's loosely based off of his original white Charvel, but. We don't have that. We didn't have that guitar. He doesn't have that guitar. Mm. Or so he says. Could be somewhere. That guitar was, as you know, I don't know if you guys know. It, you probably do. It, it was a 70s Fender. Right. It was a real original Strat. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he had a buddy, a roommate at the time that worked at Charvel. And, you know, they painted the guitar and they cut down the headstock, put the Charvel logo on it. Um, so we didn't have that guitar to spec out. And we didn't want him. We knew it was a three bolt neck. We weren't going to make it a three bolt neck. Even Jake's like, no way, three bolt. He go, he he actually glued the neck in on that guitar because it would shift so much. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, that guitar isn't super accurate as to you know what it should be. Um, it's a good representation of the Jakey Lee model. Right. Um, the Blue Burst, he has the original. And that one we specced out. And it's like, you couldn't get any closer. I mean, it's dead on. So is the blue, is the blue burst, um, does it ha also have smaller frets? Because uh, he mentioned that on the show. Uh, I wasn't sure if the production model had that, where it was like larger frets on the, up to the 12th. And then That's was... not the blue burst. Oh, okay. Those are the guitars that he plays. Mm. Um, those... When he, when he, you know, when we got back in touch, he, uh, he specked out some pretty weird things. Well, we thought were weak, that, you know, were weird, but they kind of worked out. Mm -hmm. It was a ash body, mahogany neck, ebony fingerboard, 24 and three quarter scale length. Um, the two different fret sizes. So it was like a medium jumbo up to the 12th fret. And the 13th up to the, you know, 22nd was a vintage style fret wire. It's not medium jumbo, though, isn't it? Isn't it 6100s on the, on the, uh, that yeah, one, the 6105s on the, on the top frets? That one, the blue burst is medium jumbo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But on that, the, his, that one, I that's believe, the one that's 6100s. I would imagine that's a pain in the ass to balance with the two different frets. Well, 6105 61, and a 6100 fret are the exact same height. Oh, it's just so it's just thinner. There's no height difference. It's just how wide they are. Okay. So then, and then it's dressed, and then it's it's you know it's uh, leveled and dressed. So it's it's all it's all level playing field, so to speak. Okay. And yeah. he also uh, wanted two different types of saddles on the bridge in the beginning. He wanted like a heavy stamp saddle for the E, the A, and the D, and then the Fender steel saddles for the G, the B, and the E. Um, but now it looks like he changed them all over to the Fender type saddle. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't it, didn't originally he had a brass bridge? It was all brass. It that is a brass bridge. It is okay. It just, it just yeah on those guitars it is it's just chrome plated chrome over brass oh okay yeah does that change it tonally at all the chroming over the brass or probably not i'm not sure yeah. good probably. question probably not yeah well yeah. this is tone talk come on fellas well yeah. it does sound good i can i can attest to that that guitar yeah. oh yeah well you listen i mean well, yeah i mean he didn't yeah, use I, it on the didn't on the album he didn't use it but live he uses it and it sounds great Oh, it's great. Yeah. I had yeah. it here at the showroom and, you know, plugged it in. It's a really good sounding guitar. 
you know, the other interesting thing is how he staggers the the uh, the magnets and the pole pieces. Mm -hmm. And the bridge on the on the on the pickup, the the uh, A and D strings are raised up on the screw poles, but he also pushed the slug poles up a little bit. Yeah. So it's like a it's sort of like a you know like a fender stagger, hmm. um, so to speak. Uh, and you know what? And you can hear that. It's interesting. And he put an A2 magnet in a JB. Because usually it's an A5 magnet. He put an A2 in there. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he likes to change it up, which is cool. Oh, yeah. I like it. I like it. Warren seems to be a bit more traditional, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Warren used the A2 magnet also. He does. And his pickup's really hot. It's like 17K or something. Isn't his pickup the same as it's a JB with a different magnet? Why are Sam? Mm -mm. No? no, it's not. Slightly mm -hmm. different. I mean, you could hear the characteristics, but it's slightly different. So we have a question actually from uh, the Guitar Guru Network. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, to Keith. What's going on, man? He wants to know if um, if EVH will be bringing back the custom model, the non Floyd. Mm -hmm custom model or not uh i'm not at liberty to <laughs> okay make these things okay no problem Possibly. not a problem i don't want to put Sorry. you on the spot that's cool that's cool yeah, well it certainly is a cool guitar um i'm not sure if it sold well enough though but they were great right yeah you know because most people associate ed with a floyd Right. You know, so I don't know. But uh, but those guitars are super cool. Especially, I love the back axis, you know. the uh, Oh, the, man, you get way up high. Yeah, yeah. The whole contour on that is just fantastic. And I held I held the relics that were at NAMM. Oh, that was amazing. Yes. Yeah, they were killer. They were yeah. killer. So, uh yeah, no, it's, no worries. I uh, I just wanted to you know get to his question, but we've got a bunch of questions. Um, we do. Is people watching? Yeah, we've got 120 oh people. God. 120 people watching. Okay. Um. So, okay, I'm just gonna throw this out there because it just popped to me. McConnell Mickey says, "What do you think of the Yamaha THR 10X?" I actually have that amp. Of course, those they. are cool. Yeah, they I are like cool. those. I think they're really cool. They yeah. sound great. Thanks. Yeah, when I actually when I got mine, I thought it was great, and then I found out they had the like a darker model, which was like more more gain, and or at least it had an extra like kind of more metal mode to it. I was like, oh, maybe I should have gotten that one, but I'm still happy with it. I think it's a cool cool little amp. You know, one of the um, engineers over at Yamaha. Uh, his name is John Kim. I think he had a lot to do with that amp, and I believe he's watching the show right now because I'm getting texts from him. But he's a total metalhead, and he's into, like, Pantera and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he loves Van Halen, so that's probably part of the reason why that amp sounds so good. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone said, got an original JB Humbucker, the, the dog paw, and he says, uh, sounds a bit bright to me. A mm. JB sounds bright. I know. J JB, I would consider it actually to be slightly dark. Me too. Uh, with kind of a nice mid-range emphasis and slightly loose low end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, mine's. That I have an original JB in my 86 Kramer Beretta, and um, it's not bright at all. Uh, but it's hot. By the way, I discovered something. Um, not that I discovered it, but, uh, I, I just kind of saw it online. I was like, oh, that is super cool. I, I saw that you can get these alligator clips for your spectrometer or where you're not spectrometer, your digital multimeter. Yeah. And then you can hook up a cable to it. Yeah. And then you just plug the cable into your guitar and then you can measure both your pickups. What? What output of your pickups are. Congratulations, Mark. Never knew that. 
No. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, cause I was, oh, what I was always doing was opening up the guitar and actually taking the, uh, the lead, you know, and, and putting it in the, the actual cavity of the guitar. This way is, this is so much easier. Much easier the other way. <laughs> yeah, this is so much oh, yeah. easier. I was like, oh, I'm going to plug this, like, you know, this is so much easier to get those alligator clips. So I just wanted to throw it out there in case anybody wants to do that because I was doing it the hard way. So, but, uh, Dave, have you seen any other questions come up? Oh, there's some in here. Uh, let's I know there's a bunch, but I, I'm just, didn't, didn't know if you uh, had seen any. By the way, guys, I want to throw, say this, hit the subscribe button, please. And uh, hit the thumbs up. You know, give us some thumbs up for for Mike. And tell your friends to come and hit the subscribe button too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we need we need the subscribe button to uh, to get hit a lot more. Um, okay, so L Scott Music says UA is expensive as a small interface, but you can run UA plugins, including Pete Thorne's amp. Ooh, or ours, or yours. Oh, I had no idea. Or a bunch of other ones. Really? Yeah. I actually have the uh, the runt sitting right here. This is why I said the pre Sonus sucks. I've got the runt sitting here, um, and I was using it for recording, out running it out into the pre Sonus, and it just the the whole thing was just like this 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 box just sucks. <laughs> this pre <laughs> this pre Sonus thing just you know, like it, it, it. I know the the runt. There's nothing wrong with the runt, so it it's just it's ridiculous. So so here. Here's a question from Wyatt Willis. He asked if the BE100 Deluxe, for, this is for me, mm -hmm. if the BE100 Deluxe response toggle switch is equivalent to the BE50 response knob uh, being all the way up. Yeah, no, it is. It's, it's, um, it's sort of uh, quarter of the way up, halfway up, and three quarters of the way up on the, on the switch. So it, it pretty it pretty much covers the territory that you would probably use, you know. You don't need the knob to do it. It's, you know, good enough. Uh, so yes. Uh, I got another. See, what I've got a question from Mark. Uh, he wants to know, Mike and Dave, what do you think of the new fifty one fifty three Stealth six L six versus the EL thirty four Stealth? They're um very similar. The the um, 606 Stealth probably has a tighter bottom end. The EL34 will have more mid-range, a um, little bit more compression. The uh, 606 feels stiffer, and the EL34, you know, a little bit more give to it. And I'd say we're talking about the, the 100 watt. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, and both have much gain. Oh, tons of gain. It's there if you want it, that's for sure. Tons you, of games. You can back it off. Both, they are both beasts. They are. Killer amps. They are. They're great amps. I, I mean, I love the 6L6 50 watt, the original, that I've got back there. Um, it's killer. Um, I had actually had gotten the 50 watt EL34, and I was not overly pleased with it, but... But just oh, just because of the the blue channel didn't do it for me. I was just, oh yeah. I was just looking for more. I've and I've read that on online. Some people were like that, but I think Ed was just going for something different. You know. Right. And uh, you know that that amp just was just a different different feel. What What were you looking for? Just just curious. Just a bit hotter. You know. Just, hotter. Yeah. Just you know the blue channel was more reserved on uh, you know like this blue channel is. It is a bit more beastly. It's got more, more not not in terms of gain. It just had more oomph to it. Um, uh -huh. It's hard to describe. Um, but the the fifty watt EL thirty four just seemed to. Uh, it needed a boost to get it where you right. needed it to be. You know, like that. It. And I just, for me, I I was like, so I ended up trading it and got this instead. So, uh -huh. but but they're still they're all great amps. You know. Yeah. I mean. I love them. Different flavors, right? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Actually, there's another question here, Dave. Maybe you can um, address it. I just had it. Uh, Dave, can you describe the tone of the butter slacks compared to a BE100 Deluxe? Um, the butter slacks is very heavy sounding. A lot of gain. Um, 
how is it different? There's settings on the BE Deluxe that would mostly mimic the butter slacks, but there's a couple changes still on the butter slacks that makes it a little more aggressive and a little heavier. So there you go. Okay. Uh, and here I got a question too. So uh, um, more guitars asked, can you speak about Jake's amp you're building or built, <laughs> features, etc.? I can sort of. Um, it's well, the way Jake uses it, not the way most people are going to use it. Um, Jake, Jake, uh, it's essentially a plex. It started off as sort of being a small box, but a hundred watt. Um, so it has the the plexi channel of this of the small box, which he uses on ten. So the volume, it's cranked like a vintage Plexi Marshall. Um, so that's not how most people are going to use this when they get it. Mm. And then the second channel is sort of going to be like a... It's going to have a three-way gain switch. So um, if someone is cranking it like he is, like he uses it, you put it in the lowest gain mode. Mm. And and then it will just boost the that plexi sound a little bit more. Um, if you are not going to use it that way, like most people, you'll be able to have a higher gain tone. But the gain tone is different. It's not like the BE channel. It's um, very reminiscent of old like open eight hundred slash plexi ish sort of tone. Um, it's, it's definitely different. Hmm. Uh, it's super cool. I think it's probably going to go, going to be my favorite amp that I've done. Hmm. Raw, raw and aggressive. Raw and aggressive and cool. So this is, this is a completely different channel than only anything. Two, that... Only two have been made so far. And there was a second revision that he played in Japan and and that I've been told has been sold to someone in Japan. Oh, so, um, that in one of the cabinets. Uh, so there's still final tweaks to be made. So I'm going to see how that comes out. I have to do that with Jake soon, hmm. and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. That's awesome. Oh, so, yeah, I know there's a lot of interest in that. So what are what are some of the um things that you're, you're working on mike anything you can tell us any any stuff coming up that you want to promote or nothing secret but um something that i want to promote yeah. i don't know i mean we, there's so many good artists on our roster now you know we have like angel vivaldi you know playing charvel who's a diff different type of artist for that brand mm -hmm. uh him and uh, and you know part of the series that we've been releasing like the DK24 two point uh, models they appeal to uh, a younger more modern style player. Um, it's not like everything's top mount Floyd going back to 1984, mm -hmm. even though we still do that. But we've opened up a whole new market, and um, they're doing really really well. And, you know, getting guys like Jeff Loomis on board, who's, I, I feel, one of the best lead guitar players out there right now. And he's, he has a new Kelly, and it's, it's insane. Killer guitar. And I don't know. I mean, I don't think we really, I really need to push anything because everything is doing so well. Yeah, that's uh, exactly. It really is. That's cool. No, I just figured I'd ask. Um, there's a question uh, from Antonio Ivanov. He said, "Did you, did you come out and play guitar on a song from Anthrax album Stomp 442?" Oh yeah, I did. Ah. I did. I did a uh, a lead like a just a little tail end lead at the end of one of their songs on that record. I happened to be in the studio at the time. <laughs> like here. Want to play something? Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. I actually did a show with those guys. An entire show. Um, 
they did a one-off show at the Whiskey. God, I don't even remember what year it was. And they didn't have a lead guitar player at the time. So I sat in and did it with them. And it was great. It was a lot of fun. Here's a here's an interesting question. I don't, I'm not sure if you can talk about it. Stan Adams says, "What's up with Jack White and EVH?" Uh, I guess he wanted to play a guitar that he didn't have to fight anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like basically that's what he was doing. Yeah. Um, he even says it in interviews. I mean, he he picked up an EVH. I might have been at a music store or something, and it was just so easy to play. And he's like. What am I doing? Why am I fighting it? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we'll see how that we'll, we'll, right. So we'll see if that lasts forever. Yeah, you know, as a matter of fact, I actually have uh, my original Japanese EVH, that. EVH special, left-handed. Did you put a kill switch in that? I did. <laughs> yeah, I got rid of the tone tone knob and put a kill switch. Cool. Yeah, this I is have. I have an original Japanese issue one too. This is one of my favorite guitars. This guitar plays like butter. It, this awesome guitar. Um, yeah. So I forgot what we were. What the question was. Um, oh, Jack, Jack White. White. Yeah, Jack White. So I was going to say it plays like butter. Yeah. So he doesn't have to fight it. Exactly. That's yeah. that, that was my whole thing. Um, so is he is he going to do anything? Like, is there a potential for a signature model with the guy or or no? He, he's not, he's one of those artists who doesn't like to do endorsements. Mm -hmm. He just likes to play what he wants to play. Um, That's cool. Great that he's playing it. I mean, yeah, it was it, a lot of press for, for that. us, and it, you know, to a completely different market as well. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, he, it, you know, it really probably, you know, brought a lot of people to the attention of EVH that really didn't. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. Um, thanks for the question, Stan. That was a, that was a real interesting one. Um, yeah, so, uh, there's there's a question that I found here. There's a uh, purposeful purpose asked uh, or poor put porpoise. Anyway, uh, asked, uh, can you build an? Is it possible to build an amp where all the front knobs are three way toggle switches instead of knobs? Oh my god! I'm like, sure. It could be done. <laughs> it yeah, I don't, that I don't be, do that would be so limiting. I've thought about an amp that has no knobs. <laughs> <laughs> In, input jack, power switch, standby, or just input jack and power switch. And I mean, just and go. That's it. That's it. Go. <laughs> Everything on ten. Everything's on Stun. ten. Wow. Stun. Yep. There's only one setting. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> I wonder how that would yeah. go. Um, oh, so there was a question here, uh, or at least a comment from L. Scott Music. He said, I've been to Sunset Sound, Me Plays, Killer Studio. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, when you recorded there, Mike? Like, uh, I'm just curious, what were your, was your impression of Sunset Sound? One of my favorite places to record. The, yeah, the tones great. were killer yeah kill i mean we had a ton of amps set up but jesus man that board just that room this it has a vibe i mean van halen recorded it right i was just but you know that's what i was yeah. we recorded in that same room oh and, really yeah and i mean of, of course it, there's a different board now than when they recorded but still i mean that room sounds great and it's just great vibe and they have this crazy echo chamber in there too. Yeah, the famous. Yeah, famous echo chamber. Mm -hmm. That's it's pretty so nuts cool. when you put it on drums or something. Mm. Yeah, crazy. Crazy. Yeah, that is it's legendary, legendary stuff. Yeah. Um, I also love the uh, that movie that um, which is a different studio, Sound City, but still, just uh, the the movie that uh, Dave Grohl did. Yeah. They should do a they should do a movie on Sunset Sound. They really should. They really should. So much history there. Tons of history. I mean, mm -hmm. it, as much and as much as it, as interesting as that movie was on, on um, what was the name of the studio again? I just forgot it. Uh, Sun, Sun Sound City. Uh, Sound City. Sound City. Yeah. Um, 
there's I think there's more history at Sunset Sound. You know, so yep. it's so cool. Um, Here's a question, uh, Lou uh, si- uh, Sequoia. Sorry if I got that wrong. Uh, would you know if Silver Jubilee reissues are well made? I've never seen one in person, so I, I really don't know if they're made the same. I'm really not sure. They're probably about the same as they always were. But my guess sound would sound different. Yeah, do they? They do. You know what? I um, I had the original Jubilees, and I actually had. Remember when they released the Slash amp? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Even that amp sounded different to my ears than the original Jubilee. Hmm. I don't know if they did any tweaks or changed, diff- you know, different manufacturer transformer. I'm not sure, but. Oh, you think is that the AFD that you're talking about? That amp that they no. Got? Oh, okay. No. It was basically it was a Jubilee with. Slash logo on it. Ah, uh, yes, I remember that. Yeah, one too. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, but that did it. Was it a hotter amp? Do you think that one with the slash logo? I had a friend yeah. on, who had that one. He was like, "I'll never get rid of this amp." I don't think it was hotter. Um, just totally sounded different. My original Jubilee seemed to have more bottom end than than that slash amp. Hmm. I don't know what the difference. I don't know if there's any difference or not. I haven't compared. Maybe it was just my ears. They got fried. Maybe a particular amp was better. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I had a Silver Jubilee reissue. I ended up selling it because once I got Dave's Fried, Friedman B100, it was like, yeah, there's no freaking way. <laughs> I don't need this amp. Anymore. Let's talk about my 71 Marshall that Dave modded for me. Let's talk before, about it. He actually had his own amp line, right? Before, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, mod, I modded it way back. Which amp was, was this again? I'm first, sorry. First one I mod. A 71 Super Lead Marshall. You still have it? Oh, yeah. It's mm, a it's great sounding that. amp. <laughs> What'd you say, Dave? He's not getting rid of that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, nah, it's a great amp. Was that like a precursor to the Brown Eye? Yeah, it was one of the first. Actually, well, not the first, but one of the first sort of Brown Eye mods, yeah. Wow. Yeah, sure was. Well, that's documented right here, so now your amp's worth even more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just that kidding. amp, are the Brown Eye mods different now or basically the oh. same? Same. Okay. I just worked on yours, so. Same. Yeah, you did. So it's wow. the same circuit, same thing. I mean, you know, every amp you do it on sounds a little different. Right. So does your Depending. 71 have a, uh, a master volume? It does. Okay. That amp, when I first got it, it was unusable. It was so loud. And I've owned a lot of Marshalls. It was really, really, really loud, but like a painful loud. Mm-hmm. It wasn't pleasant, you know. Um, but Dave did his magic to it, and I love it. I love it now. It's a great amp. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out why you label that one knob knob drive on the back. It's not really a drive knob. A power drive. Or uh, Yeah, I don't know. It was the name I came up with at the time. It actually changes the power amp gain. Okay. In the power section. It's a response knob. That's what it, yeah, it's a response knob. Because when you turn it all the way to the left, it gets spongier. Yeah, it's a response knob. It's, I right. just, I called it at the time power drive because it, it, it was changing the gain in the power section of the amp. So yeah. it's like how much gain, but I, you know, the name didn't make sense in the end. So, <laughs> so, but now you have those response knobs on your amps, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, let's get some, some more questions here. Oh, here's one, another one from Stan Adams. Another interesting one, although you may not, uh, be able to comment on it, but at least I, we can say he says an EVH custom shop would rock. I so wish that would happen. Yeah, it definitely would. But if you want custom shop, you're going to have to buy a 78 or a Frankenstein or something. Yeah. Basically custom shop EVH. 
But I, I get what you're saying, like a custom shop, like Wolfgang, where you have options and. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. like kind of going back to the the days. I think PV had it at some point, right? Right. Which certainly was cool, but I, I get it. I mean, it's all about manufacturing, ease of manufacturing stuff. But but I love I love that that you know you guys have a yeah. I guess maybe why does Charvel and and Jackson have a custom shop and maybe EVH doesn't? If, because Eddie makes the call on things. Yeah. That's there you go. Enough said. There's been talk, talk about that for years. I, I remember there was talk about that years ago with Matt and stuff. And yeah, I mean it comes up now and then. Should, Could happen. Who knows? Maybe in the future. Yeah. Again, cool. like, it's not like you know you don't have the facilities to do it, right? I mean, there's already it's already happening with Charvel. Yeah, we have our custom shop there. Right. Right. So it could happen. I actually have an yeah. amazing. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. All the USA EVH EVH stuff. You know, it's all built on that line for specialty brands. Mm -hmm. You know, in Corona, so it's part of the custom shop. Yeah. So it could happen. Good. Yeah. 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 Um, I've got an awesome custom shop, Jackson, uh, soloist that I got, and again, it's a lefty. Um, and it's a silver sparkle that Dave makes fun of me with, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 fun. What did I say originally when you showed it? To me? It's you go. It's very sparkly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, very sparkly. But you know what? I was actually in Corona the other day and just watching these guys build the guitars. They're they're the best of the best. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike Shannon had to reshape some of Jake's necks on his guitars, including his main white one. And just, he does it so fast. It's, it's ridiculous. I'm like, man, he, he's just like, not even looking, basically. <laughs> How's this? It's crazy. He's, he's been doing it so long, he knows exactly what to do. Yeah. And, you know, Red Dave and Joe Williams. I mean, these guys are so good at what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of these guys, I mean, they came from the school of Grover, right? Mm-hmm. Well, Mike Shannon built Randy's uh, number two, the Black Roads. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he worked, he worked with Grover at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Legendary. That's... Yeah, he is a legend. Yeah. That's just so cool. Um, so we're almost hitting the two-hour mark. Um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, do you want? Well, I have some sort of have to be soon, so. Uh... Okay. Um, Dan Pfeiffer says, "Did Mike use solid state marshals back in the day? I seem to recall he did, but might be confusing him with somebody else." No, I did an ad for Marshall. Um, it was Wayne Static and I in the same ad. Wayne used the valve state marshals. <laughs> And I used, at the time, DSLs combined with my 800. Um, I did use a valve state once in the studio for a little part, but I didn't really care for it that much. Um, Andrew Zen, interesting question, but I don't know if we want to get into that about Eddie getting, what Eddie gets on sales of the guitars and stuff like that. Let's just say it's... It, we um, can't talk about that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's appropriate. Um... Question for Dave. Uh, what is the wattage of your everyday soldering iron? I'm going to buy a new one soon. <laughs> That's a good question. Because <laughs> I, I, I need a new one as well. And I, I keep slacking on that as well. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. You know, if you want to buy a good one, get a Heiko. But that's a station, soldering station. It's adjustable. Um. But uh, other than that, there is a cheap one. But I don't have that information right now that I know of that's really good. I just don't have the information handy and I'm not going to get it right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a, there's, a, you know, if you check out our page, actually check, if you go into the notes, I'll post a couple of links. If I remember, uh, um, I mean, if, if, if you're going to do a bunch of soldering, it pays off to get the station that that's good. Yeah. I bought one cheap ass one from home. Yeah. Depot. It doesn't, it, I mean, <laughs> It works. It gets the job done, but 
it's just bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not good. So it's so funny on some things you just cheap out on, you know, and other things you're like, no, I'm going to get that really great Jackson soloist, but <laughs> I don't need a great soldering iron. Um, so uh, let's see if there was any other questions. Um, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll head out. Um, what someone says, what about paste soldering irons? They're made in the U S never heard of them. And then someone never. says Weber. Um, all right. But, uh, Mike, it was awesome to have you on the show. You know, thanks I, for having me. Yeah. I mean, just to get to know you, I know we've, uh, met here and there, but just to get to know you and learn you're from a fellow New Yorker and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Even though you're transplanted in California and I'm in I'm, I'm in Florida, hopefully you'll make it back one of these days. Yeah, you know it'll we'll never lose it. No, it'll always be in us. Exactly. Did you uh, did you ever speaking in New York? Did you ever make it out to like when Anthrax was practicing in Queens at that building that they used to practice at? That was before I worked with those guys, but. Yeah. Um, no, no, I, yeah, I, that's when Metallica was there as well. Right, right, yeah. yeah. I had a, bud, a buddy of mine who was, had a practice studio there at that same building. So I was just curious if you knew them back then, so. I I knew the guys, you know. Right. Different time. Didn't go down there and hang out or anything, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I have one last question for you. Can you tell us any fun stories or any, any anything that stands out when you were on the road with uh, any one band like Alice in Chains or Metallica or, or anybody? Anything that stands Pantera. out? <laughs> Pantera, yeah. It, it always goes back to Pantera. Well, yeah. what I want to know is how many times did you puke on the Pantera tour? Uh, who knows, <laughs> man? I, 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 yeah he, several we'll say several probably i remember one time in the tour bus i think we were in germany i'm like grabbing my tour manager I was so drunk i'm like i love you man you know it was one of those moments just like flying <laughs> on his shoulder it's like thanks dime and then the next day you wake up like oh jesus man what hit me Good times. Good times. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Those are fun times. Um, well, I want to thank you again, Mike Tempesta. Thanks so much uh, for coming on. Um, thank you. And uh, nice yeah, no doubt. Um, we actually have. Um, I'm buying next time. Okay. On you. <laughs> Inside. <laughs> yes. Um, our next guest is. And I forget the date, and my phone is dead now. My battery uh, is Michael Nielsen. Um, and let's big see, Harry Guitars. Yeah, big Harry Guitars. Um, and <laughs> I think that's May. God, I think that's May twenty fourth. Um, and then the following guest we have um, in June is going to be John Cusack from Cusack Pedals. John's a good guy. We like John. Yeah, which will be really cool. Um, and then we we also have uh, Nilly Brosh, who's a really great guitar player who's going to be coming on. Uh, female guitar player. She's just rips it up. I, I love watching she's her. Great. Play. Yeah. She yeah. her her Instagram videos are just all of her. She's got such great enthusiasm and and uh, she's she's awesome. Um, so she's coming on, and there's a whole bunch of people coming on. So. Um, so we'll keep you posted. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, please. And thumbs up. Give us a thumbs up. Um, and uh, let us know if you have any other questions, guys. And we'll we'll get back to you. Um, Dave, thanks again. No problem. Hope you have a good weekend. Mike, hang out while, we fin while I hit fi finish here. And then we'll say goodbye offline, all right? Okay. All right. Everybody have a great weekend. All yeah. right. Cool. Great weekend. Yeah.